Uh, hi guys, um, thank you for joining me and thank you very much indeed to Zoe for giving me this opportunity to have a chat with you about ways in which I have been taking stock of what I do as an artist and why and how um, using this pandemic and the isolation and the lockdown as a bit of a opportunity to positively reevaluate uh, who I am as an artist and how I engage with my practice and why and everything else. Um, so the image that you see here at the moment, this is a section from an Instagram page that I set up actually at the beginning of February. So it was before really um, the coronavirus pandemic really took hold in the UK. And it was actually something I set up initially um, because I had registered to do the Macmillan Cancer Mighty Hike, which is a fundraising hike uh, 26 miles in a day with 50, 500 meters of uphill challenge um, so for me that was actually quite a big challenge I genuinely don't know if I can do it um, and I took it on for lots of different reasons many of them personal many of them other really um, but I just thought it was really interesting because as an artist I do a lot of walking anyway um, so I do a lot of residencies I did really seek out places that are remote and or coastal as well um, and I have been developing a lot of my artistic practice um, around responses to coast and the erosion and um, the interaction between the sea and the land and also the migratory seabirds um, and the way in which they kind of symbolize this sort of migrant community which come and go and the relationship that they have with the rocks and the coast and the erosion so aspects of um, our experience of coast which are temporary and those which are permanent as well um, so what you see here, um, image here, is a collection of images that I put together at the beginning of uh, creating this Instagram journal, which runs alongside my Mighty Hike, which is a collection of visual images which are capturing um, aspects of my different walks, which I've tried to make into a daily post. Um, so along came the current isolation period and everything that it brought with it, the chaos, the confusion, the stress, the anxiety, the contraction, I would say, of all of our worlds. And suddenly we are constrained within a very immediate habitat. Um, but what that also brought with it was a complete kind of interlude in all of our usual occupations um, and a kind of breathing space, I guess, really. Um, everything fell away, and I'm sure it's the same for you. So. I had 18 months of my professional life completely mapped out. Um, exhibitions, events, residencies, teaching work, education work, projects, lots of project partners, some of them already agreed and fixed, some projects um, partway through being developed as well. And suddenly all of that within the space of a week collapsed. And as I say, it sort of fell away. And it was felt to me like it was sort of stripping away all of the context around my artistic practice. Um, so I'm really used to being continually in a process of either working on or towards a project, on or towards an exhibition, or events or participatory and engagement activities that sit around that. Um, and suddenly it was all gone. And suddenly it was just me and the work and no knowledge of who might actually see anything that I might create or produce, who might engage with it, or how, whether those engagements would be online or whether or not they would be direct and physical. Um, and I began to recognize that whilst I was managing, as you know, I'm sure everyone was, a lot of the kind of actual process of dealing with this transition, um, it was affording some space to kind of evaluate and reconceive what I was doing as an artist really um, and why because as I say suddenly it was just me and the work suddenly there was no defined audience for this work there were no project partners or funders whose agendas needed to be met or criteria to be satisfied um, suddenly there was no particular demographic for audience engagement as I say it became this really pure relationship between me and my practice as an artist um, in the interim time, lots of stuff has actually re-emerged, um, but it's been such an interesting journey already that I have gone through personally for the last six weeks. 
and it's felt incredibly developmental actually um and stuff which i would have liked to have been doing but i think i was always so busy in the process of doing and delivering um that it's been difficult to actually step back from it really so i look at this as a sort of evolving relationship with covid19 as i say initially it sort of felt like a contraction Previously, paintings and drawings uh, have used metaphors from the natural world to explore human behaviour, permanence and impermanence. I've been doing a lot of work for quite a few years now, for at least the last five years, using the rock as a metaphor. Um, we associate rocks with permanence, yet also when we actually visit the coast, rocks in different forms, in different states, in different proximity to cliffs and or the actual seabed itself, um, alter as they go through that process of erosion. And they are anything but permanent. Um, and I've been really interested to explore that. And it started to move into broader explorations as rocks that mark out boundaries um, and present themselves as boundaries, rocks that become barriers and people use them as something that's kind of immovable as well. Um, and I've been interested in perceptions around the permanence of a rock compared to fantastic cacophonies of migratory birds that come in their thousands to various different areas of the coast at certain times of year to breed and then to fledge as well and they've become an immense presence but they feel individually as if they are quite fragile and quite impermanent compared to the rocks but the rocks and the cliffs become their home so those things have been kind of enduring themes which have been running through my work um, so as i said i've already i you know done a lot of walking um, and i had also signed up to do the mighty hike um, and i signed up to do that at the beginning of february and i had been sort of knowing somehow that there would be some sort of relationship formed between the two things but i couldn't actually identify exactly what form that might take um but i realized actually almost as soon as we entered this period of isolation that the rhythm of the walking which for me is very much like a daily meditation as well as a physically demanding challenge um as well as an opportunity to actually get outside and sometimes consciously think and sometimes consciously unthink um, and open up my brain a little bit um, and the brief that i'd set myself to document these walks um, finding new and creative ways of making familiar walks fresh and different and finding different angles and different ways in which i might document the walks became a really important thing immediately um, so I've already mentioned that I was doing quite a lot with birds, um, looking at migratory seabirds and their relationship with the rocks and cliffs, and sometimes mapping their movements, um, sometimes walking around stones and giving them an idea or a sense of erosion and movement as well. And what I began to find in my daily walks, um, this is going back now, sort of six weeks, was loads of these little um, feathers, which were from the fledglings that were falling from the trees um, they felt like such a clear indicator of the huge community of birds that were there in the woodlands as I was walking through I can obviously no longer get to the coast um, I live in the Blackdown Hills um, so I'm obviously stopped going to the coast that's no longer accessible to me um, what I have around me are hills and lots of woodlands um, and I began to recognize that actually ways in which I was making contact with the birds in the community were through these traces that were left behind through their feathers that were dropped from as i say the little birds when they're fledging um through the bird poo and some of you will have seen and i think i know actually some of you have commented on it now uh, being quite entertained with some of the beautiful images I, i've spent some of my walks just photographing the bird poo as i go uh, because that seemed like um again kind of like nature's paintings so they're the paintings the birds are making but they're also the traces and the indicators of the habitat and the activity of the birds um so i would say it's been a case of kind of reacquainting myself with familiar terrain um i've become really interested in looking at all of the footprints and when i was first undertaking these walks it was really wet weather we had an awful lot of wet weather in uh february and early march um and everything was very boggy and in fact i wasn't doing a lot of walks in the fields and the woods um and of course then everybody when lockdown began everybody started walking the same routes and so some of the routes were immensely well trodden um 
and I was really interested in the the kind of um, combinations of dogs, deer, footprints, um, tire tracks from the mountain bikes, tractor tracks as well, everything under the sun that was starting to merge together into this lovely kind of community. And although we're physically isolated, you know, we can rewalk each other's steps. Um, and that then sort of led into something which I've, I've done a little bit of in the past, but I've always wanted to do more of, which is foraging and experimenting with all the different ways in which we can make food and delicious goodies. Actually, this was some nettle soup that I made a little while ago, which actually was the food of the gods. Um, wild garlic and roasted walnut pesto. Unbelievably good. Dandelion root coffee, dandelion flour risotto, dandelion leaf um, pestos and salads and all the rest of it. Absolutely fantastic. And I was beginning to become aware that I was bringing, I was going with my backpack and bringing so much of my walks back to the studio and back to the house with me, not just through the photo archive that I was beginning to collect, um, but also physically as well. Um, and at this point, I was also finding I was spending time just really pausing to contemplate what my role was um, within this lockdown period, within this time where the whole of the industry of the arts has shut down. What's my role actually now as an artist? What should I be doing? What can I be doing? Um, and how can I begin to narrate this story of what we are all experiencing right now, which is this kind of closer proximity and relationship to our own habitat, our own locality, um, places that we think we know. I'm a dog walker and I walk these same woods all the time. Okay, that's not new. I go away a lot and do residencies, but I also know, or I thought I knew my local terrain really well. Um, and suddenly my relationship in terms of, in terms of engagement seemed to shift and alter. Um, so what I've got here, this is the studio table one day. Um, I've been making lots of rubbings using different materials of different surfaces in the woodlands. Um, in the middle of the table there, you can also see early, early experiments with actually extracting some of the pigment from the flowers. So that was actually taking some just old recycled papers up into the woods with me and literally grabbing a handful of dandelions or a handful of buttercups, sorry, um, primroses, um, and scrubbing them into the surface of the paper just to allow them to release some of their pigment. Um, to the left and above, there are various different books. I started picking up books that are on my bookshelf um, that I'd had for ages, and some of them I'd never read, I will confess. Some of them about the history of botanical arts, some of them about gesture and acting drawing, um, some of them about drawing projects and that kind of thing. And just kind of reconnecting and considering what the role of the artist is today and what it always has been to a degree. Um, the image actually in that book on the top left there is a superb, superb little study by a, um, a 17th century artist called Alexander Cousins, who I'd never heard of before, who was doing amazingly avant-garde stuff in the uh, middle of the 17th century, same time as Joshua Reynolds was working, um, exploring something called, that he called his block method, which is like an automatic process for generating compositions stuff I didn't even know, contemplate could have been happening all those years ago. Um, so I, I, I continue to sort of pause and ponder what our role is as artists who are engaged with the landscape uh, and what it always has been. And essentially, it's about bringing the outdoor environment in. And that's what the landscape tr tradition has always been about. It's about giving people new ways of connecting with landscape. Um, it's about creating provocations to make people think differently. Um, and it's, it's about somehow capturing um, what it is that we experience when we're out in the landscape in different ways um, and bringing that together in a way that will make it um, challenging sometimes, accessible, questioning, um, provocative, all those things really. Um, so there's a bag of dandelion flowers that I brought back that then I turned into some dandelion flower paint. Um, and some of my um, some of my ponderings here, I just realized I've written 18th century down there. That's a lie. It was 17th century Alexander Cousins. Um, but my desk research took me to David Beach, um, wonderful artist, contemporary artist, um, some of whose podcasts I've been watching. Um, and he's talking a lot about during this isolation period, 
um, about how it's throwing up questions about the relationship between our work life and our um, domestic or leisure or personal and social lives as well because the boundaries are inevitably blurred we're all working from home now the kind of actual physical proximity of all the different aspects of our lives are overlapping more deeply than they ever have done before um, and I think that's really interesting and I'm feeling that profoundly um, and also I, I, I discovered stuff I never knew before and it's sitting in books I'd had on my shelves for literally more than 20 years um, but Cy Twombly and his incredible natural histories, and there's some examples there um, that he created, where he was looking at the interface between science, nature, and human existence through art, and wanting to kind of create works, which are composite works, which comprise all of those aspects. And I was beginning to think, yes, this is fantastic. This is everything that I have always been about, but suddenly I can see it more clearly. Um, and as I say, Alexander Cousins, incredible artist, uh, working 250 years ago, who was making massive statements about breaking with convention. Um, so at the same time, I was also having conversations with all the people that I would consider to be the stakeholders in my practice. Um, that is everybody. So that's the people who are the audience for my work, the project partners, the gallerists, the dealers, the funders. Um, the commissioners of all dimensions of my work um, about what was going on from their perspective right now and how we might all move forward with this and kind of what a liberating moment we were having of being able to take stock at the same time as a moment loaded with anxiety about what the future holds. Um, and where I came to um, was this notion that I was at a point inevitably where for me the decommodification of art and my artistic activity felt like it had an opportunity to become primary rather than secondary. Um, I've often, as I say, found myself immersed in projects and exhibition commitments and all that kind of thing, which have driven the work. And actually what I want to do is I want the work to be the driver and all that other stuff to sort of sit around it. So no longer do I feel like I'm creating a product which is meeting any kind of other requirement or that it needs to be something permanent or tangible. And that was fantastic. Um, and I began to recognize that these blurred boundaries between work and life, that's some wild garlic there, um, were actually something which was pointing me in a new direction yet one which is wholly consistent with everything that I feel like I've always been about um, and dilemmas that I've had in the past suddenly there seem to be some answers around them so what do I mean by that I mean that actually I was able to sort of somehow for the first time really distill what my artistic priorities really are when I strip away the stuff around them when I strip away project requirements, exhibition requirements, um, audience engagement requirements, everything else. Um, and for me, the form that has taken has been to actually begin to experiment with creating paints made from the most fugitive materials. So paints made from dandelion flowers. I know that the paintings I have made will disappear. Um, and at the moment, I'm carefully protecting them as much as I can from the daylight because I know that they will disappear probably to nothing. Um, but I got very excited about this. I got very excited about having the opportunity, as I keep on thinking of it as a kind of interlude at the moment, to allow myself to play with stuff which isn't permanent and not to worry about it. Um, and then I realized that this is by far and away the most exciting work that I've made for quite a long time. That's how it feels anyway. So here are just a few um, of what these things are looking like. So these are a couple of paintings I've made using dandelion flower paint. Um, these are actually paintings of a stone that I brought back. Um, here it is, I haven't put that in the video, that's the stone. Um, brought that back from the woods on the same day as I brought back a bag of dandelion flowers that I then macerated. In fact, I've been trying all sorts of different recipes, um, different ways of making the flower paints, some of them boiling them, mixing them with all kinds of different things, um, gum arabic, some of them have got vinegar in them, some of them have got bicarbonate of soda, salt, honey, glycerin, all kinds of different things to try and actually see which works best. Um, but I was immediately, totally, 
blown away by and excited by the potential of what was happening actually to the work because what I've got here is the most fugitive, the most impermanent paint that I could possibly be working with. Um, yet I'm working on depictions of this stone, which as I say is loaded with metaphors and associations with permanence. But actually it's creating the most fragile version of a rock that I could possibly conceive. Um, but I'm only able to do that through actually physically starting to play with these processes. Uh, what excites me about that is because it feels to me to be the most appropriate depiction of a rock that I could possibly be making during this period of immense uncertainty. Um, for me, this encapsulates everything about the fragility of this COVID-19 pandemic and everybody's lives and the turbulence around them. Um, I've started to ask myself questions like, am I becoming a botanist suddenly? This idea, as I say, that, you know, when I was researching Cy Twombly's work of art equals the interface between nature, science and humanity is really interesting. Um, so this is a little sketch that I made actually out in the woods of a dandelion with some of the dandelion pigment rubbed into the drawing itself as well. And I, and I started to ask myself questions about what is the difference between what I'm doing and a botanical artist and a scientist and does it matter anyway and this kind of interface is becoming so natural and again it's something I've been exploring how to develop a really good meaningful interface between my work and scientific research base for quite a long time and it really feels like it's coming together. Um, what I'm also doing at the moment, which has been uh, fantastically good fun, is I've also been connecting back with my own community and locality, um, collaborating with people, plants and wildlife, people that I've worked with before now. Some of you will know that I did quite a long collaborative project uh, working with sheep farmers and another artist, Debbie Locke. We ran a project called Flock Together. One of the um, smallholders who worked with us as our kind of conduit between us and the, and the bigger industry farming community um, got really excited when I was talking to her. She lives in a village just a couple of miles away talking to her about the fact that I've been taking photos and got really interested in bird poo. Uh, so I invited her to lay down some plastic sheeting underneath where some sparrows roost in one of her barns and to ask her to take photos of the sheets every day to document the activity of the birds in the barn. Now she's absolutely loving it and I can't stop her sending me these photos. So here's four photos that she sent me of the same bit of plastic. I've asked her now if she can put some clear acetate underneath some other roosts um, see if you can collect some of the bird poo that I can then maybe later on ping off the acetate um, and start to use and apply it in and for itself as well. Um, but she's loving it because it's become her own project. She goes out every day to go and see to her sheep. And while she's out there seeing to her sheep, she's monitoring the bird poo drawings. Um, and she's starting to talk about them in that language. And it's fantastic. And she is loving the fact that her being part of this project, her documenting stuff that I don't have access to, sending me the photos each day, asking me if they're okay or not, asking me about resolution, um, and beginning to see this as a different form of drawing is completely mind-blowing for her. Um, so that's kind of me and where I'm at, or more or less where I'm at at the moment. Um, and having chatted a bit with Zoe at Somerset Artworks, who's been massively supportive of all of this, um, we decided that we would uh, use this as a catalyst for a project that we would like to involve you guys with as well. Um, and the project's called Somerset Reacquainted because I know that when I've been talking about what I've been doing, it's felt like a real reacquaintance with nature, with myself as well. And it's stripping everything away. I feel like I can actually see clearly. It doesn't mean it's an easy time, but it does mean that there is space to view and to review and reconceive things. 